Well, here's something that's been out for a while, but uh, we can add some new info to it. This is the Tutankhamun DNA Project, they call it. You could call it the Akhenaten DNA Project, or actually the 18th Dynasty, or New Kingdom, or Egyptian DNA, or a lot of names. Are you direct male descendant of the pharaohs? Igenia exclusively publishes the Y-DNA profile of Tutankhamun and starts a search for his last living relatives. In the year 2009, extended DNA tests had been carried out with the mummy of Tutankhamun and other members for his family. These have only been partially published in February 2010 despite several demands the results of the Y DNA or male pattern DNA test have been shut away. Now, to get an explanation of what they're talking about here, there was a Discovery Channel thing going on and it was all hyped up, and they were testing the DNA of Akhenaten and his family, including females and all the mummies that are associated with it, to find out if they were correct in their assumptions of everybody and who they were, but also if there was any inbreeding, if this was his half-sister, so on, and also they were going to try to look a little bit into genetics and see if there was something that caused the anomaly that they look at in Akhenaten, or if that caused the problem with Tutankhamun himself, or so on. And Tutankhamun's name was Tut Tutankhaten, of course, because of Akhenaten, but Akhenaten, how we really should look at it is that he was Tutmosis IV. And so this carries all the way back. And the way that it works out is that it's passed from father to first son in lineages that go on down through. There are very few exceptions. And of course, there's always brothers of princes and so on that go on and they're putting on major nobility roles in the society as far as scribes, priests and so on carrying out these duties and that's why some of these times whenever you'll see a dynasty fail and it goes to the next one they figured out well that actually goes back to this person's granddad and his brother was so-and-so, and that becomes this guy that's talked about here. And that guy's son is this guy. So really, it's like family anyhow, and it works off lineages. And so they parse their way forwarding all the way through the dynasties from the origin. And that's the way it had always been kept, uh, with, again, very few exceptions. Now, Igenia was able to reconstruct the Y-DNA profile of Tutankhamun, his father Akhenaten, and his grandfather Amenhotep III with the help of recording the Discovery Channel. A recording on the Discovery Channel showed it in one of their video footages, although they didn't reveal it. Let me again go with what they were showing here was they were saying they were going to show the genetics and all the results, but they didn't. And uh, Hawass, Zahuas, thought that he had revealed the results whenever he said, yes, we found out Akhenaten is Tutankhamun's father and this, that, and the other, and yeah, it's his half-sister and all the stuff. That was good enough. But, of course, that really wasn't good enough for a lot of people, including these guys that run off the same equipment, apparently, and use the same software. And so by looking at that and stopping and looking at it real closely they were able to take down the numbers plug that into the machine and lo and behold it popped out who they were in fact probably the guys looking at it if they were that into it would be able to look at the numbers because they deal with it so often and say you know who that what that is and work off of it so they were able to come out with that but there's been a second study now done by the same people that had the first information, a deeper study connecting and what they were trying to do again is look at all the genetics and how it goes on through, but because it's a genetics paper, they went ahead and revealed the rest of it, confirming what these people had said all along. 
and at first glance it was reported as R1B and other people said actually if you put that in there it comes out as RB R1B 1A and you'll hear it referred to now as RM269 because that's a way of taking something like R1B and showing you that not only is it R1B and all these people are R1B there's little subtle variations in between that that show that this group is slightly different than that group are there connectives or not and that this M269 is really just a variation of R1B and so there's R1A and R1B and these people become pretty important to humanity but let's go through this information here as we go are you a direct male descendant of the pharaohs Tutankhamun belongs to the haplogroup RM269 which more than 50 percent of all men in Western Europe belong to and below are all these numbers that they cited that probably goes along with the picture that they saw and it are markers and there's 16 of them and depending on what exact numbers are in each little marker point in your DNA through parts of it that we often thought were junk DNA it shows these little markers now over time these scientists that are working in genetics are able to look through all of these situations and find out well this is the common thing and then there's all these little subtle variations and things on a theme in doing so they'll find little trigger points where hey there's this little sequence here that's all messed up over time they might find that repeatedly and if they find that repeatedly with people that exude the same problems they can infer from that that this type of genetics might be something that causes X or Y so as we get deeper and deeper into this this is going to help us out genetically to figure out what's happening and so on and of course what happened so this they put out a search for living relatives knowing this number and everything and of course they they do it across Europe because that's where the majority of these people are today and we'll look at that here after this in another presentation in the current project we search for the closest living relative of Tutankhamun's male lineage in Europe to take part in the Tutankhamun DNA project and order one of the following tests if you profile uh, if your profile matches Tutankhamun in all these 16 markers they show above they refund your payment and you receive a further DNA test as an upgrade for free so they'll go into a deeper DNA test and a full spectrum to it and of course free in doing so too I believe there's already been a kid that's been identified as being catching all these 16 markers and then they did the other thing to him and uh, he got his face on the news or a picture of him and stuff and I often described it as uh, well you know that vampire kissing movie that they had a few years back where there was the werewolves and the vampires and people had to choose sides from Jacob and so on you know, the vampire guy that's there he kind of looked like his goofy brother well I said that because he has kind of a goofy, goofy smile or something but it really in retrospect seeing the picture again looks a little bit more embarrassed caught in the moment but having a smile and I actually wonder what he would look like in a normal picture other than something that looks like that caught in the moment and everybody ogling over him but um, anyhow so he looked a lot like him somewhat and that's only one of people but there are hundreds of thousands that should easily fit up under this number and what's neat about that is you can actually find out directly by going deeper in the DNA even than what they said in the 16 here that they already have the information of off of retesting which has been done now on them which I'll show you here shortly and find out if you're actually directly related to it not that you have the same haplogroup which a lot of these other genetic places try to tout all the time and oh you're related to so and so because you had the same haplogroup and it's like no you'd have to have the same variant at least and then that's still somewhat skeptical of saying that you're related to him in some way 
well, it would give you a false sense of things, but imagine that there was somebody that it was his great, 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 great grandfather of you and the person that leads to him. And so you're not necessarily, well, like he had kids and kids, and then there's you, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. People often misuse statements like that, but let's just continue. Background. This haplogroup RM269 arose about 9,500 years ago in the surrounding area of the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Like Gobekli Tepe and above that and the Black Sea area that's there. The migration of this haplogroup into Europe started at the earliest with the spread of agriculture since 7,000 B.C. Well, mm, yeah, that's kind of the spread date of it now, but now we've had it where it goes back to a little bit before that, and they find it coming across just a slight difference in date. And agriculture, we've already figured out. Even Britannica, it'll show you now, dates it at about 14,000 B.C. But I've made a recent video, not to talk about my videos during this, other ones, but where it shows bread making and situations and sickles in an area that has a flat plain that has some trees growing up over it now and apparently has for thousands and tens of thousands of years but that dates it back at 26,000 BC but they can't say that they had the agriculture there but here's the river and it overflows into this area or wood now but it's been a rose in that area due to all the vegetation building up the area still kind of does but not like it would have done if you yank out the vegetation here, wham, here's a little floodplain situation associated with these artifacts. It's probable that it's also connected with these Indo-Europeans who spread over Europe a little later in several waves of migrations. In my other videos, I've talked about these waves of people and different successive waves and how there was an early one and a later one and then a more recent one and in certain civilizations and how that kind of worked out so again this must have come from these people who started agriculture around the Black Sea area and it's probable that it's connected with those Indo-Europeans who spread over Europe also a little in several waves of migrations in Egypt the contingent of this haplogroup is below 1% now and partially caused by European immigration during the last 2000 years this separate statement is an indication that the people who live there now are not actually the people who were living there then there's been a demographic change in it and that there's still some left, mainly in the Coptic population that's in Egypt. But there had been an extreme migration out of it. And a lot of that was encompassed in the last 2,000 years. Some of my other videos show you where there was a few other events that predate those. And then there was the Exodus situation out of the Bible and so on. But let's not get into that. That's for total other videos. Tutankhamun had been the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and ruled from about 1332 until 1323 B.C. Solo, he reigned for about 11 years, but at his co-regent of his mom, which he was symbolically like married to, ooh, no, it's, it's different. He had to be king and queen. They had to work out. But she and advisors and so on were running the show until they got old enough. His paternal lineage begins with the pharaoh Tutmosis I, who ruled from about 1504 until 1492 B.C. Well, 1492. Funny how that comes up again. But So what we're saying here is that this lineage genetically works out from Tutmosis I, the beginning of the 18th dynasty, and it's one of those parse things that worked off of remnants from the 17th dynasty and it faded away. They say Tutankhamun was the last pharaoh, but we also had the pharaoh I that took over after this, 
and so on, and it decayed, and that was the end of it there. But there also wasn't actually a rightful heir to go into it, and then again, here's that part situation where where it came next was selected off from people that were related to others before. Grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and people that are related to these people we're talking about now. And other related people, like Thuya and Yuya, which were the great-grandparents of Tutankhamun, or the grandparents of Akhenaten. We've talked about other videos on those people and their blonde hair that's kept and so on. You know, a lot of this was done with the Discovery Channel to try to kick back in tourism somewhat in Egypt. And I really think everybody ought to check it out. It's incredible. But it was helped to mean so much to kick it in. And then it, because they kind of fell flat at the end and not give out the genetic thing, it would look like they were given a hokey type thing. And then they, of course, had local troubles and so on I don't want to go into. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then... Of course, now we've had COVID, too. And they've been trying to get it back ever since before that. And then with COVID situation, they want you to join. In fact, there's been one little video where it shows that one of the lady archaeologists that's working out there is still working during the time. And she and she just looked up and smiled and says, we've been wearing, wearing masks the whole time. Where have y'all been? Of course, they wear that to keep away from dust and stuff going on. And then when they go to open tombs, there can be mold and certain things associated with a opening of that and uh woo you know like a, a curse of Tutankhamun in the situation so they they do wear it for a little while and if they ever go into a tomb that they haven't opened for a long time they actually have to stand outside and let the thing breathe for a while before they let you go in and nowadays they have like co2 meters and things like that, that they can go in there with and it starts beeping they go yeah get out of here but if they let it breathe out a little bit that seems to help in, in a lot, but in its state that it's supposed to be kept at, it wouldn't have that situation and, and being open and breathe very often. And so that becomes something that you have to do not so often. But recently they've had videos, well, I've showed in a couple of my videos, and they've been making this rebirth again, trying to get it kick going as COVID dies out. And people start getting going and shunting off the last of the people trying to make everybody conform in some way and so they started with this golden procession which was actually taking from the old museum to the brand new museum which is, gives you a brand new reason to go to by the way because they have so much things on exhibit supposedly all the things they ever had on exhibit and then all the things that they ever shuttled in and conserved and then showed it to the public and then put it back away and things like that over the years. If you add all that up, that's less than half. What they have on exhibit right now in the new place, and then they've got other things that they're going to start shuttling in and out. So if you want to see what they thought was going to be like, bam, start it off, check it out because probably in a year or two they'll start shuttling in a few exhibits. I don't know how often. But it's all been an attempt to get this back going for them. For They basically do live off of tourism in a way there. And if things kind of ruin that, it can really become a problem. You can imagine during COVID how that could have become stretched pretty thin. So Tutankhamun had been the last pharaoh, they say. And... Of that dynasty and it began though with Pharaoh Tutmosis the first who ruled from about 1504 to 1492 BC and his paternal ancestry is unknown I'm not sure what they mean after that and maybe maternal and they switched this a little bit but his maternal ancestry is already known and it's haplogroup K but and they've confirmed this repeatedly too so Perhaps what they're really referring to is going back before that, they haven't tested it at the point to go, okay, so it was his great uncle, or so great great grandfather, Pharaoh Tutmosis. That's when the, the one that goes down, and his great grandkid is the guy that takes over the 19th dynasty that leads to Seti and Ramses, the redhead, and so on, and it goes on through there. But 
this red-headed type stuff and blue-eyed type stuff is not something that comes on late in the dynasties at all. Ginger, the pre-dynastic Gibeline mummy, is supposed to have been in the wars that helped make Egypt come together as a place in the first place. He's blonde, hence the name Ginger in, in the British Museum, and it has been forever. But also, if you look at the earliest statues that they have from the earliest of dynasties, it shows pale women and red ochre males, just like Greek art and Etruscans, Minoans, and stuff of the time. People try to misconstrue it or act ambiguous, but genetics ends up taking that ambiguous out of the situation. So, they tell you, therefore, it's still unclear how this line came from the region of its origins to Egypt. They're going to make some assumptions, and I've got other ones. The earliest evidence of agriculture dates back to 5000 BC. It's possible that the haplogroup RM269 moved with the north moved from the north to Egypt with the spread of agriculture from the region of the Fertile Crescent. Actually, it dates back a little bit before that. Yeah, and in the area of Egypt, they've even found a place that was put off and everything and then it dates back. They were able to actually date it and it comes from before then a little bit. But what it does come with is these things that they call the package. And it is different fertile grains like emmer wheat, barley, and so on like that. But also with domesticated animals like the cow and so on. So whenever you, at the earliest of the dynasties or even pre-dynastic with the Narmer palette that you see in the top of it, even though it's shaped like an arrowhead, shows you Hathor and this cow goddess and things, it comes from a time from way back when of these people that used to live up there and they already had this whole dichotomy set up. In fact, as they spread, which I show in other videos, not to keep going into this in this one, but where they spread out of there and down into, well, of course they had it going on before, but Cattle Hoyuk and after that point, and spreading east and down into the Mediterranean, all around the Mediterranean, people that they try to associate known as the Natufians, but I believe that'll be broken up a little bit later because whenever you do something like this, it should be a certain people or a wave of people and not actually come across as the way it is and then it'd have to be renamed somewhat. And Natufian was taken from one certain single site and worked off of there, but as it grew, it's kind of outgrown itself almost and a lot of people don't know it know of it or refer to it at all but this also correlates with a recent paper that they've shown where 6500 BC at least if not older blonde haired blue eyed people were coming through the holy lands and by through we indicate that they went on around the Mediterranean and so on and ended up having to become the Libyans and Berbers and so on but of course up the Nile and Egypt, and at 6500 BC, we're predating any formation of Egypt whatsoever, but bringing the cattle into the situation as an, a wave that we were talking about earlier, and how that, and another successive wave, really at the time of forming, and right before, ended up putting two and two together and coming up with a much better number, and heralding the situation that we know of as the ancient Egyptians. The fourth expansion wave of the probable Indo-European Kurgan culture that I've done videos about between 2500 and 2200 BC is also a good candidate. This culture spread since 4400 BC, making it fit within the number, to Europe with explains the correlation with haplogroup RM269. This haplogroup was widespread in the Indo-European Hittite Empire in Anatolia. That's Asia Minor. That's what we currently call modern Turkey. But you'll notice in archaeology, they always say in modern-day Turkey or ancient Anatolia. To make you understand in an era we're talking about, where they also the demographic has quite changed over this time. And when they say ancient Anatolians are hooked up to this, the people of ancient Anatolia, as I've shown you, and he speaks of right here having this haplogroup as far as the Hittites and the major group 
that was right along with that and the people of the Golden Fleece of the ancient story of Jason the Argonauts ended up also becoming part of Western Europeans but if you'll look at Galatians of the Bible and how that really works out they're really a Celtic people that were well known living down in this exact same area during this time in question of 2000 years ago and farther on back in time some but when we're looking at this quite often we're talking about what came into it thousands and thousands of years before that and apparently appears to be unchanged so they talk about this fourth expansion wave so here it's almost agreeing with my wave concept that I had come up with 35 years ago or more now and of course whenever you try to discuss things like this you're looked at as either a racist or something like that in a modern day where they try to act more ambiguous about things that they apparently had already figured out well before and when genetics comes out like this and it's just a verifier they still try to pull that on you like somehow it's racist to point out reality versus say feelings So this culture, the Kurgan culture, spread since 4400 BC to Europe, which explains the correlation with Haplogroup RM269, which are essentially the same people in a different way, right? Like you could just say on a simplest way of looking at it is look at these West Europeans that we see coming out all in the Middle Ages and everything, and then whoopsie, look at how many of them are making up America all of a sudden. Here's migration. Here's one, there's one. They tell you that one happened in from Egypt from leaving the ancient Egyptians into modern day now. The genetic paper on Abu Ser Melek actually points that out directly. And also what admixture shows up much, much later than anybody wanted to talk about. But this haplogroup was sped with the Indo-European Hittite Empire in Anatolia from time of Akhenaten or Tutankhamun's reign there was a letter of an Egyptian queen who is known from the Hittite archives. In this letter, she asked for the king for one of his sons as a new pharaoh because her husband has died and she her health, herself has got no son. A lot of people have made the correlation that this has to have been Tutankhamun passing away and his wife, Oxenamun, would be wanting someone else from here before this time in the Amarna period Laird, so they were all calling each other brother and so on Herodotus tells you the Colchians and the people that he's talking about right here in that area were the ancient Egyptians and it wasn't because they had tanned skin from farming or curly hair or anything like that that denoted it really to them because everybody around here has got that going on what different, differentiated them and gave them the clue was that their way of doing textiles and that they practiced circumcision, certain rituals that they had going on. So people try to misconstrue things sometimes, but whenever you put it all together and the people of Golden Fleece and all that type stuff, it seems to make more sense. This was kind of well known, at least in my early childhood and generation type situation, and as more and more came out about it, it seems like we've decided to try to become ambiguous. Again, genetics no longer leaves ambiguity. They tell you the identity of that queen was unknown, but perhaps the 18th dynasty was related to the Hittites even. The origin of M269 lineage could point to this because they have that same genetics going on. Well, there's other genetics that we found that go along in it, and just regular, not necessarily common people, but other nobility and common people. And they have J haplogroup and G2 and all these different ones. And quite often, there's a U6, U5, or uh, K maternal haplogroup that goes along with this. In fact, you see a lot more floating around, it seems, of the male 
have love group, then you do the females somewhat, or at least from my experience looking through it, there's a large contingent there. We'll show you that in another minute or two. So the detailed context can only be clarified by further research, by the publication of the test results, we want to contribute to the scientific discussion and bring it forward. In a Spanish paper, there's 70% de los varones españoles comparison in of DNA con Tutankhamun. They have up to 70% connection. There's Dutch people who say they have a common connection with Tutankhamun's lineage. King Tut may have been more European than Egyptian. Well, I, I contrast that, you know, it depends on when we're talking about. I study ancient cultures, and so we know that this culture, as we just talked about, came over from the Black Sea area and brought agriculture into the Europeans, but that's really Western Europe now. And when we look at the haplogroup R, R1b and where it exists on the planet right now, it kind of pinpoints and shows you exactly kind of which demographic we were talking about. So... European parentheses nowadays than Egyptian parentheses nowadays. But that also says the same thing. The people that you know of as modern Western Europeans are directly related to the people who were ancient Egyptians and the nobility of a few other civilizations. From every second person from Switzerland has the Pharaoh's DNA. Every second person. They could just say 50%, right? But say it in that way. Genetic indigenous peoples by Ingea. By ancient tribes, we refer to people from ancient times who are defined not only by their language, culture, or history, but by also their DNA. An origins analysis of Igenia determines your ancient tribe by means of your haplogroup and genetic profiles. The result refers roughly to the period between 900 BC and 900 AD, roughly encompassing where you were, what was happening, so on. But we look at their declamations here as being Jewish people, Vikings, Celts, Germanics, Basques, and so on. Basques have some unique qualities to them. The Germanic versus the Celtic or ancient Celtic is really close. And so are the Vikings, but they're variation on a the theme. And then the people we call the Jews are the Ashkenazi that we're usually looking at, who is coming out of Japheth through Gomer. But when we look at Jews in this situation we talk about, we don't really talk about the 12 tribes. And that does encompass the people that actually make up the other three here that are next to it. So you can order this analysis and check it out through them, and it's pretty neat. But uh, so how do they do it? They give just a mucus sample, and it'll give you direct DNA. They don't uh, you have to take a tooth out or do anything like that that they have to do with these ancient mummies because they've been all desiccated up, and like a piece of beef jerky, they actually have some direct things that you can do just off a swab. I think that the more detailed one goes with something a little bit more and you have to do a scraper on the inside of your jaw. It's no big deal really though and you can find out what's happened to you. So let's look at this other presentation here done and I hope I don't run out of time here. Let me plug this back in as we switch over. This is Egyptologist 7. She works with genetics and genetic studies quite often and goes through a lot of ancient cultures, their admixes and things that had happened over time. And this is one of her little presentations that she put out. It's about four minutes long after this DNA study had come out. So here's another picture of Akhenaten. While they show him in the Marna period with this strange thing, and some people have said, oh, that could lead, it could mean this and it could mean that, or it could just be some strange crap or hey maybe it could be marfan syndrome and everything well they don't really show that in this paper and it really doesn't show up in the reality of things whenever you look at this and other statues and sculptures that really don't show you any effect like it does in those certain sculptures which were done in a little mystical way the only thing that's odd about it is is that they kept things for so so long and all of a sudden he changed the look of things 
He also tried to change it to monotheism, and that's very telling too, but let's continue. There's the Aten, the sun. So this paper, oh, well, the top there, let me see if I can get it out of... Don't tell me I'm going to ruin this. So let me go back into full screen. So this is from a paper, Insights from Ancient DNA Analysis of Egyptian Human Mummies, Clues to Disease and Kinship. And this was done by the exact same group. Here's a closer one of it. Done by the exact same group that was hooked up through the Discovery Channel. And so this is just further study and going farther with it. And so what she wants to note out here, or the paper gets quite long sometimes, the royal male lineage is from the Y chromosome haplogroup RMB that was passed from the grandparent Amenhotep III to the father, which was KV55's mummy, Akhenaten, to the grandchild Tutankhamun. So they can tell directly from the mummies which one was which one's father, and so this works out correctly with the KV55 mummy. But also, just knowing whatever Tutankhamun's R1B was, then that says that's what his father was because that's the way that works. So there's no really any question into it, and it folds back, much like Egyptians going from father to son and first, which you'll see in a lot of cultures hooked up with these same type of people. But it hooks up through that and goes to the grandchild, which ends up being Tutankhamun, and the maternal lineage, the mitochondrial haplogroup K, extended from the great-grandmother, Thuya, of Thuya and Yuya, to the grandmother of KV-35, the elder lady, Queen Tai, to the yet historically undetermined mother, KV-25Y, the younger lady, to Tutankhamun. So this is the direct connections. And this is out in a genetics paper that's again by the same people that did the study, and it hooks up as being R1B with all of its marker, 100% in the analysis. In fact, here she shows the same thing I started with here, and then are you descendant of the pharaohs because this is the alleles and hooks up to it. RM269 was previously classified as R1B subset 1A2. Starts to sound like the thing that you said when you made the Starship Enterprise blow up to 2003 and 2005, but R1B1C reclassified in 2005 to 2008, and R1B1B2 to 2008 to 2011, and they've decided, well, instead of going with all this Starship going to blow up names, what we're going to do is just call it, it's subclad, and so it's RM269. RM269 arose approximately 10,000 years ago near the Black Sea area, as they spoke about, and was part of the Neolithic Revolution. Yeah, the brand new world to take people out of things, but of course, this is at the end of the Younger Dryas. We don't ever talk about what was going on before then, but this sure was a dramatic time of change that it took thousands of years to accomplish, but there were some waves that whenever you added them up together with certain civilizations triggered what we call civilization today. Today, RM269 is represented by 2.9% in Egypt, so maybe that 1% out of that, well, there's another demographic there that's also not even involved, so you figure that in. It's about 1%. 7% in Algeria, 7.3% in current Anatolia and Lebanon area we're talking about, but it ends up going up to 81% in Spain in certain areas and 92% in Wales. Yeah, Wales, those people have a dragon on their flag and stuff and everything, but yeah, it's also extremely high all over 
Western Europe and into uh, Scotland and Ireland and uh, the whole area is blended with it quite well and you can almost see it like blended up there let's take a look at that here in a minute the migration of R1B people can be followed archaeologically through the presence of domesticated cattle which appear in central Syria around 8,000 or 7,500 BC then in the southern Levant and Egypt around 7,000, 6,500 BC at the Nabda Playa and Bir Kasiba places. There's already some farming starting to go on too, as I talked about before. So now we're looking at percentages here. If you look at the graph on the right as it slips away, we're looking at basically up to 60% or more the darker that it gets and so we look at Egypt currently and there's a little blur that's in here that's a little bit darker pink than the tannish pink that's there but in Anatolia and that's why they keep mentioning it in all these studies when they try to say well they were like a, uh, ancient Anatolians well there's still a big remnant of what's there it's a little darker here good dark banding over here and Afghanistan and through the areas in fact one area is pretty prominent and there is still a hub left of proto Europeans but a lot of this pink used to be in this area encompassing it more like this is now all over there that's how you can see it leads into the Spain and France into all of what we call Europe UK and the islands over there right off the edge of it Haplogroup K has its origins in the mid-Upper Paleolithic, likely Western Asia. K is found in Central and Southern and Northern Europe and North Africa, Horn of Africa, South and West Asia. They've gotten around. Help, sell, uh, help herald civilization. K is found in 6% of the native Europeans in the Levant, 16% of the Druze of Syria. Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan belong to the haplogroup K. It reaches 8% in Palestinians, as well as 17% in Kurdistan. And that's over in that darker area, too, where somehow it's associated in that area. K has been discovered in the pre-Pottery pre Neolithic B site of Tel Ramad, Syria, at 6000 BC, and early farmers of the Central European area, in 5500 BC and is associated with, directly with them. Specimens in Greece dated to 7605 BC belong to K1C Otzi. The frozen ice man who I did a video about not too long ago and incorporated it belongs to K10 or 10 at 3300 BC and that's roughly at the timing of the forming of Egypt leading into the pyramids. He has tattoos so does that blonde Gibeline pre-dynastic mummy known as Ginger. And they found that on them, but so many others. And the ancient Libyans, even in the art, showed it. They have it there. Let's continue. K has been observed among mummies at Absu Abbasir El Melek in Egypt. K really broadly can control or can subsist or is subsisting all across North Africa somewhat all through the Holy Lands up around the Caucasus Mountains through Anatolia Greece and into Europe it no longer has a stronghold east in Proto-Europeans lands as it did at one time but you can still see it in Yemen somewhat and leading over into the top part of India. Let's continue. So this is kind of the way it would break down from Tutankhamun up, looking at R and how it passes from father to son in a way that would directly work out, and the females involved, and how it works out during the tree. all through the 18th dynasty and on
like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy. We'll get on to more revealing archaeology and other interesting topics.